When tragedy struck a young Russian boy in September of 1990, strangers from across the world united to attempt a rescue that had never been done before. It's a story that reminds us all that when a child's life is at stake, there are truly no boundaries. In a remote part of Siberia lies the wind-blown seaport of Magadan. Every afternoon when school lets out, children who live in this mining center head for home, including eight-year-old Anton Avdienka and his friend Maxim Bulgakov. My best friend is Anton. Because he defends me and sticks up for me. We spent lots of time in the yard, almost every day. We are good friends. After school, I said, let's go make a fire. We'll toss some potatoes and bread. Anna Avdyanka had just gotten home from work. Anton's always into things. He always has a torn up knee or a bruise here and there. And he's very active. He's into everything, but nothing serious. On the way, I asked Anton, oh, where are we going to get some matches? And he said, my brother Denise and I hit some in a hole. Once they had the matches, along with another friend, they went to gather some wood and kindling from a construction site next door. Behind the house, we saw some barrels with some kind of liquid. The barrels were just standing there, and they smelled kind of like oil or shellac. And I said to Anton, this liquid will burn really well. We held the barrel, and Anton put the can up to the hole. And we leaned it over hard, and the fluid came out very fast. It wet him from his knee to his elbow. I said to Anton, go change your clothes. He said, my mom's going to be mad at me, and they didn't go. Anton, давай. Let's go to the fire, it's very good, it's going to burn. Let's go, what are we going to do? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Sasha threw a piece of paper in the fire. The paper started burning the sticks, and then the stick caught fire with the fuel. Then we all sat down to toast our bread. On her way home with her young son, Irina Panasok noticed what the boys were doing. I went up and I told them, you are lighting the fire. And you know that's dangerous. You don't know what might happen. At that moment, I noticed that my son had kind of run far away from me. And then a piece of paper that was in the fire flew out and landed on Anton's leg and started Anton's leg on fire. Within moments, the fire had spread over his whole body, and in a few seconds, he was like a torch. The flames were higher than his head. When I heard the screaming and I looked out the window, I saw a burning torch. I couldn't see his face because of the fire, but I could see his red cap, and I figured out it was Anton. 
I did the wrong thing. I know that I should have wrapped him up completely in something to put the flames out. But I was in shock. I just died. I didn't know what to do. It was horrible. It was terrible, terrible memory. A truck driver who delivered water in the area saw the smoke and fire and stopped to help. It's impossible to say how a mother feels when she's losing her child right in front of her eyes. It seems to me that my heart broke into little pieces and couldn't be put back together again. Anton said, Mother, don't cry. It's my fault. It's all my fault. He kept saying, Mommy, don't cry. Everything will be all right. It seemed like the ground was falling away from under my feet. Unable to get help by phone, a close family friend flagged down a passing truck to drive Anton to the hospital. I was looking for the scissors for a long time, even though I knew perfectly well where they were. Everything was confusion. I cut off the remnants of his pants. I took off his jacket. I took off his cap. It was a horrible picture. His legs were all black and red. His left hand was injured. It was bleeding. His lower lip was broken on the left side. Everything was hanging down. It was very painful, very frightening, and very awful. Anton's father, Vladimir, was just returning home from a trip to the store. When I started getting close to the house, I saw the truck standing at the entrance. They upset people near it. And I started getting a weird feeling that something strange had happened. But I had no idea that it had happened to Anton. I saw Anton coming out from the entrance. My throat was chalky, with tears. The truck drove Anton and his father a mile to the main hospital in the area. I wish I could put myself in his place, do the suffering for him and, and for him to be well. Doctors at the Magadan Regional Hospital immediately rushed the boy into the first aid room. The first thought I had was, how can I leave him alone? But probably every parent has that feeling at the difficult moment when leaving one's child behind. Burns covered almost 35% of Anton's body. Doctors and nurses removed the dead tissue and did all they could to ease the pain and disinfect the wounds. The first night when they took Anton to the hospital was difficult to take. Anton was not with us. When you lose something precious, it seems that you're no longer alive. What is there left to live for? The most precious thing that we have are children. Most burn victims die of infection. To reduce that threat, Anton was isolated from all contact with the outside world, including his mother and father. Despite the best efforts of the local doctors, his condition began to deteriorate. On the third day, they told us that the burns were very serious, very deep. They told us that they had to try to send him somewhere to a burn center, since there are no burn specialists here. The nearest Soviet burn center with space for the boy was thousands of miles away in Moscow, and they had no means of safely transporting him in his weakened condition. 
It seemed to me that the doctors were beginning to prepare us for the worst, and that was because he might die. When we continue... He kissed this little boy goodbye. He didn't know when he would see his son again, and I couldn't reassure this dad that this little boy was going to be okay. When an eight-year-old Russian child, Anton Avdyanka, was severely burned, he was taken to the main hospital in his hometown in Siberia. Though the local hospital did everything they could to help the boy, with each passing day, his condition was growing worse. After six days, Vladimir could no longer stand the forced separation from his son. He noticed me and started crying a little bit and stretched his arm toward me. Papa, come to me. Why don't you come see me? I'm here by myself. I didn't pay any attention to the rules. And I went to him and kissed his hand. And asked him what he needs. What can I bring you? He asked for his favorite toy. As their son's condition continued to deteriorate, Anton's parents were no longer willing to just wait and do nothing. They heard that some foreign exchange students and their American teacher were coming to Magadan. Vladimir went to meet them at the airport to ask for the Americans' help. His name is Vladimir. I want to ask you for help. My son is in the hospital. Uh, I ask for help because my son got burned and now he's dying in the hospital. Oh, no. Larry Rockhill didn't stop to think for very long. He told me there is a man in Alaska who can help. Maybe you have an opportunity to contact some American doctors you know who could help. One of the first people Larry called was the director of the Institute for Circumpolar Health Studies in Anchorage, Alaska, Dr. Ted Mola. We wanted to make sure that we could really help him because if you really think about the reality of it, no one had ever brought anyone out of the Soviet Union that I know of into the United States for treatment directly. What's going on? What's the medical... While Dr. Mala tried to cut through the red tape to get official government permission, on her own, Betty Johnson worked day and night to find a burn center for Anton and the means to transport him. I worried that I would not be able to get anything done for this child before he died because third-degree burns are very significant, and I was very worried that he would not make it. I felt that there was a possibility of failure, but I was going to give it my best shot. It took three days and hundreds of calls, but Betty managed to get the Shriners Burn Institute, the Rocky Mountain Helicopter Company, and the Providence Hospital medevac team to provide Anton's care and transport for free. And Dr. Mahler got both the U.S. and Soviet governments to grant full permission for the flight and even waive the visas. Marilyn Belanger was a flight nurse on the historic rescue attempt. The type of trip that we were going to do was not going to be anything different from the daily work that we do. But the destination was the exciting point. I had never been to the Soviet Union. So there was some apprehension going into new territory. When we were flying over, we didn't think of Americans and Russians. All we thought of was the patient and the life. After a five and a half hour flight, they arrived in the Soviet Union. We did see an unusual sight when we landed because usually there is a truck that says, follow me. But this time there was somebody on a bicycle with uh, reflectors on and a flashlight and basically this jet was following the sky on a bicycle to the place where we had to go and park. It was pretty amazing.
Little more than an hour after touchdown, the American medical crew arrived at Magadan Regional Hospital. Our reality is that we want to go in very quickly, take the boy and get out. But the Soviet system is much different. When we got there, they wanted everyone to sit down and have dinner. <laughs> they were concerned that we had been up all night and they just wanted to give us a little soup and uh, rest for half an hour before seeing the patient. When the group of doctors came with Ted Mala in charge, he explained that from Alaska, we would be sent to a hospital in Galveston. Well, for me, it was completely incomprehensible. I didn't know where Galveston is or what that is. During the long drive to the airport, Anton's parents rode with him in the ambulance. A nurse gave Anton a little bear. The bear was always with him. There's even a drop of Anton's blood on it. He loved it. Only Anna would be able to go with their son to America. The moment we had to part, I kissed him. I asked him to be brave. You get where you're going. Get better, then come back soon. He kissed this little boy goodbye. He didn't know when he would see his son again. And I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't reassure this dad that this little boy was going to be okay and he would come back well. And still today, that's... That's one of the moments that will stay with me for a long, long time. Two hours into the flight, Anton's airway started to close off. His respiration slowed down and he had to struggle to breathe. My heart was in my boots. We knew that we could not put Anton through the remainder of the flight in the condition that he was. The patient is no longer stable. His respiratory condition has deteriorated and he cannot carry on to Galveston. An emergency stop was made in Anchorage, Alaska, so Anton could be admitted to Providence Hospital and stabilized. Later that day, he was transported to Galveston, Texas, where he was met by surgeon Paul Waymack of the Shriners Burn Institute. This was one of the deepest burns we have ever seen. Most of the burn patients we received, we received within 24 hours of their burn injury. In such patients, there has not been adequate time for bacteria to invade the burn wound and cause infections. But Anton had been in the Soviet Union for two weeks following the burn injury. And during this time, his wounds had become extensively infected with bacteria. When we flew to Galveston, Dr. Waymack met us. And after they looked at him, they explained to me what they were going to do, how they were going to do it. It was all new to me since our doctors never explain anything to anybody and don't tell you anything. I wondered, why are they telling me all this? I had such a strange feeling, but I liked it. Approximately 33% of Anton's body was burned, but what made this burn unique was the fact that the burn went all the way down through skin and fatty tissue to muscle and bone. So we used cadaver skin to cover the wound. It took two and a half hours of surgery. Massive doses of antibiotics were also administered. Then the waiting began. 
to see if he could overcome the infection. He was lying there. He was all swollen and covered with medicine. And he looked at me and started to cry a little. And I comforted him and told him not to cry because you shouldn't get your face wet with tears. It might get worse. And then, of course, I went into the hallway and became hysterical. Anton's condition began to improve. Five days after his arrival, doctors replaced the cadaver skin with grafts from unburned parts of his own body. Okay, we're going to save the best piece of skin for the face. I want the second best piece here for the hand. The depth of the burns was so great that in some areas we had to remove tissue all the way down to bone and tendon in order to find something that was alive and would accept the skin grafts. Okay. Pick up. Add some. Five days later, occupational therapist Kathy Gross began the next stage of the boy's painful recovery process. Anton, like any other kid, can get upset with us when, when he's experiencing pain and often um, gets angry. You should do it. One, two, three, four, five. He's a very motivated child, and I'm sure that Five years from now, you'll look at him and you probably won't even be able to tell that he was burned. What? <laughs> the happiest moment, I think, was that I got back up on my feet and that I came out alive. I think that the doctors who treated me in Texas were the best of all. When they did the physical therapy, it hurt. But it doesn't hurt so much now. After three weeks in America, eight-year-old Anton Avdyanka was well enough to return home to Russia to be reunited with his family. It was a great joy to return home with a healthy, live child who walks on his own legs, who runs, who's happy. We're all together again. I'm very grateful to everyone who participated and for their involvement in our whole tragedy. We were happy to be reunited, he and I. Maybe 10 times more than usual. I had such a feeling of relief that we were finally together again. I want to thank all those people who helped me. All the people who gave me blood. And those who were able to give money with which I was able to fly to America. And I learned that marches are a bad joke. I don't think I'm going to be playing with fire again. Now, I feel very well. I got much better when I returned back home.